uh, and welcome to this very exciting succession BAFTA masterclass being conducted uh, as a webinar, as everything is these days. I'm Boyd Hilton. Um, it's my great honour uh, to uh, be hosting this event. Um, we're going to be joined by the creator, um, exec producer, showrunner, writer of Succession and one of the directors. Um, and we're going to be talking about seasons one and two. Um, we can't say anything at all about what's going to be happening with season three. Let me make that right clear from the start. Um, please welcome uh, the creator of the show, Jesse Armstrong. Hi, Jesse. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thanks. And the director, Becky Martin, who directed season two, episode seven, which Hello. we'll come to in... Uh, hey, Becky. Let's go on to the nitty gritty, uh, Jesse. Um, just to go back to the origins of the show, in case anyone doesn't know, um, was it the idea of creating a story about a huge family owning a massive media conglomerate? Was that, was that the appeal to you? Did you want to kind of tap into a deep dive into that kind of family? Was the milieu of the media and that, that kind of huge corporation, was that important to you? What was the initial um, spark for the show? Yeah, very much. Um, it was, uh, I'd written a screenplay almost over a decade ago now about the real uh, family of Rupert Murdoch. It was kind of a, quite a weird tone in that it was a fictionalised future imagining of a of a of, of them spending some time together, and um, that never that was hard to get made and never got made. Um, but I guess I'd had that that impulse, and much later when I was thinking about a show to suggest to HBO um, after we finished making Peep Show, um, that idea came back and I did a bit more reading um, and the idea broadened out. And, you know, I, I guess I always knew about Maxwell and, um, you know, Conrad Black, but I, I, I didn't know so well the American landscape, uh, you know, the, the Disney family and um, Eisner's reign there and, um, and Sumner Redstone and um, the Mercers who own Breitbart and... Um, the, the Smith family who own Sinclair, who own who are right wing and own a lot of um, local news stations in the US. So those things came together. And yeah, it was, the, I, I love writing families, but in a way I, I first approached it as a sort of political, sociological, how the hell have we got to this position in US and, and British politics um, kind of viewpoint. And Having, it, it strikes me that this is the kind of show that where authenticity is everything. Like you've, you've created a world where we have to see this family in the situation of their, their news channels and their newspapers and their, you know, in these huge, impressive skyscrapers and in their daily lives, living these very luxurious, glamorous, exciting lives. Was getting, getting HBO involved, was that a huge help in the sense of kind of depicting that world in as authentic a way as possible? Yeah, I mean, you could imagine doing this show at uh, a, a different scale. You know, you can do anyone who saw that small movie Margin Call or there are ways of doing this world without showing the helicopters and the opulence. But it, it's great if you can, because that's the that's the texture and nature of the real lives of these people. So if you have that budget available, I think it it creates a, a much more real picture, just as you say, you know, that, that the authenticity uh, or attempted authenticity is, is a, is a flavour that we're keen on uh, for the show. And um, that budget allows for that. You're right. And when you're establishing the tone of the show, um, I mean, it's obviously it's an hour long. It is very funny um, throughout. And um, you're obviously mainly known, I think, as a comedy writer. Um, but, um, did you establish that? Did you know what tone you wanted to go for from the start? That mix of very kind of um, sometimes black, sometimes extremely sharp humour with the intense drama that the, all these situations create within this world of this family. Yes. And, you know, tone is one of those, it's, you know, an ineffable thing. And it's the sort of like the most important thing. I'm sure when you review a new show, um, there being a uncertainty about the tonal uh, feel of it is is one of those things which you know I think viewers respond to and they respond well to being reassured that the the creators have a, a comprehensive um, view of that tone and 
I think that the, the, I wrote I wrote the pilot obviously, and the pilot is the same tone I think as the show. People may feel it's altered. You know, viewers sometimes spot things you don't see yourself. But that that was the tone I wanted to go for, and it's um, it yeah, it's a it's a it's a, a tone which encompasses comedy because I think that the real world encompasses comedy, and and if you leave it out, then you can end up taking these. Um, big figures at their own estimation which you know if you don't include their ridiculousness it is their pomposities um their vanities their failures then you you present an incomplete picture of them so i i think comedy you know is very much a part of how we respond to the world so i think it has to be in there and it's you know amenable to me to put it in there and how important was it you had adam mckay directed the the pilot um, who directed loads of great comedies and kind of quite political, satirical films. How important was he in the process of developing that time? He was very important. You know, he was important not least because uh, I, 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 maybe HBO would have made this show without me, but I'm sure it was massively reassuring to them to have such a big name and a big talent involved, and it, it probably made them more likely to make the show. So there's that practical element, and then, yeah, he's an, he. I'd known him a little bit. I'd written a, I'd written some screenplays for his company that never got made, um, but he he's a nice man. He's a smart man, and uh, you know, one of the many things that can go wrong with a project, a TV show, or a film is that people are making a different thing. You know, the director and the writer and actors have different ideas of it. We were we were lucky in that maybe because we both come from comedy worlds, maybe because I knew him a bit, um, maybe just because of luck, we w we had the same idea, I think, of what we were trying to achieve. You know, his, his shooting of it with um, a sense of getting behind the scenes, the handheld, was very amenable to me and to the material. And he, and he comes out of comedy, so... Um, as I'd learned to do with Armando on the thick of it, um, he was keen to do loose takes at the end of when we'd got all the material that we needed. Uh, and I think you get some good stuff out of that and you also get a um, atmosphere on set, a sort of permissive atmosphere of being able to encourage the actors into the, into the process, you know, um, and, 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 I, I like that and I think it works for the show. And you, you've got a, a writer's room, you've got a team of writers you, you've brought in, you've assembled for the show. How was that process? Was that, was that a new thing for you or was that something you were used to? And did you create your own way of, of using that, that system, the writer's room situation for this show? Yeah, I mean, in a, I'm, a, I'm a natural sort of collaborator. I can, can and have written things sort of on my own and when, I, when it's time to write script, um, uh, Sam and I would always write separately and, and then collaborate Sam Bain who I wrote Peep Show with um, and when I write Succession I always write apart but collaboration has always been totally key for me and when Sam and I would come up with scripts you know in a way that's a writer's room it's a writer's room of, of two when, when Sam and I had come up with plots I should say we did it as well on Fresh Meat which had a mini sort of English writer's room so yeah, I, I felt um, not uh, out of my normal realm by running a, a more US style writer's room. It's bigger in scope, bigger in length, bigger in terms of the amount of uh, thinking and talking you do in the room. But, but that, that sort of collaboration, um, I wasn't used, unused to. In fact, was, you know, it's how I've always worked in a way. And can you give us, uh, I know it's a kind of complex issue, but some insight into, you know, say an episode is credited to you or Tony Roach or, or uh, Lucy Preble or whoever, whichever writer, what does that really mean? How, how, what does it mean when a, one of your writers kind of takes charge of an episode, if you like? What, 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 how does that process work? It's a good question. And it, it's a little bit, a little bit flexible, but I, I, I guess... What, when I write one, it tends to be pretty much all my stuff, and then, and then, and then on the day, and Becky can talk about this how we how we work is uh, on the day 
we'll often have a bunch of moments, often comic moments, but sometimes not, where we might write some alternative lines to throw in um, on the day. So, so that portion of the script is often um, collaborated on, or I might occasionally ask a, one of my fellow writers to take a look at a scene that I'm having a problem with. Uh, other people's scripts, sometimes they're, you know, very much um, entirely their take. I, I always do a pass on everything um, it, 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 to maintain sort of tone and hit things that I want to hit. And, um, and, and sometimes they're more rewritten it, and using the talents of the other people in the room. So, um, yeah, it's a slightly movable feast to get as much good stuff from everyone as we can. Great. Um, let's bring in Becky. Um, so, Becky, you direct, we'll have a look at um, some uh, the recap of your episode that you've directed, episode seven of season two, in a sec. But before we do, um, how did you, you... I know you worked with Jesse before on Peep Show. You worked on Veep. You directed an award-winning episode of Veep, I know. Um, how did you get involved in Succession? Oh, well, I guess, really, my connection with Jesse through Peep Show. Um, but then it's funny how things work out because Veep, uh, I'd worked with Armando years ago before I was directing. Um, so he was obviously aware of me, but um, Veep came about through an email from Simon Blackwell, who also wrote on Peep Show and just said, um, he's doing this show for HBO. Do you fancy doing it? Um, uh, <laughs> not really much of a, a brainer. Um, so... I guess it's one of those things where you end up just working hopefully in the same circle of people. And, you know, I don't think uh, Jesse can correct me, but I don't think maybe I would have gone straight from peep show to succession. There's a nice bridge with having worked on Veep for HBO and they get used to you and, you know, then it smooths that path a little bit, but yeah, it's quite something to go from, filming on off the side of a motorway in 2007 you know in the cold to suddenly finding yourself in some glamorous location somewhere all thanks to jesse <laughs> so how, what's your starting point really when you're directing an episode like this you've got the script obviously and, and is there a bible for the for, in terms of the visual look of the show that you're following or can you or do you take it your own way to some extent uh, you have a, a fair bit of say but obviously when you come in as um uh a director just for one episode you can't really change the complete style the the best thing is that it it doesn't stand out as an episode in a visual sense you know that it just melds into the to the rest of the season um but obviously with that you get a lot of help from your cinematographers directors of photography with how they've done it you, i mean it's a weird thing to, to direct episodic um, because obviously in, in the UK, quite often you're, you're doing the whole se season. So it's um, quite a skill just to drop yourself into a huge juggernaut production that's all been up and running and everyone's worked on episodes and you, then you come in and you've got to sort of, you know, not ruffle too many feathers. But I mean, you you do have some say there's a kind of um, shooting style that you definitely notice in the pilot which is a, a lot of little um, zooms in on camera uh, during scenes um, and it's very effective at getting a kind of pace and an energy and um, its own kind of um, drama sort of you can punch up scenes now weirdly although i although i love it if it suits a scene it wouldn't be my choice to to do that for everything because i think actually sometimes you, you then become too aware of it and it distracts from the drama so i basically my my i came in and just looked scene by scene how do I want to tell the story of that scene? What's important? Is there a pace to it? Um, 
you know, in, in my episode, I had a, a long uh, lunch scene um, with Shiv and Raya that definitely needed to just hold, settle. Uh, so we were very still with that. We just did a few tracks in, but basically held the frame and just so that you can concentrate on performance. Um, then another scene when they're back in the UK, but they are um, having a conference call back to, the, to New York and they've literally just found out that the press have got hold of the story of the, the dead kid. Um, that really did lend itself to those fast handheld little punch zooms in. Um, and there's a lovely, I mean, just from my point of view, that I mean, with that, you can't, you can't direct it. <laughs> you have to let the camera operators who are highly skilled just follow their own flow with that. And they've seen a rehearsal and you trust that they know who to zoom into at the, at the right moment. And sometimes they get it wrong and you think, oh, we just missed that. Another take, they'll absolutely get it spot on. But more often than not, they'll get it absolutely right for you. There's one little tiny beat in that scene. It's such a small thing, but this is where that style really lends itself, I think. It's when Kendall is saying to his father, um, everyone else has left the room and it's just the two of them. And uh, he's saying, are you, sure, are you absolutely sure that Ray is the right person to be seen with? Aren't you making a bit of a fool of yourself? And there's just one framing where we're on Kendall and then the camera just pops down to his hand, literally timing just as he's doing that. And it's such a nice little accent. So it's really, it really purely depends. I just look at it on reading each scene, seeing what the how the story has to be told and deciding that way. But, but absolutely collaboratively working with the people who know the show inside and out. And that's the crew who've done it way more times than you. And the cast as well, obviously they'll, they'll have their own feeling about how they want to do things. Yeah, I was gonna mention the cast because you're obviously you're, you're stepping into this now pretty well established show. I know. Where incredible <laughs> cast where every single actor feels like the perfect person to play each role. <laughs> to an extraordinary extent, and we feel like we know them as three-dimensional human beings. What's that like, kind of arriving in that world? Are they, you know, I've said, I'm not expecting you to say it's anything but a, a, a joyous place to work, but is it, is it a kind of difficult thing to suddenly be directing yeah, all of these? I mean, I mean I've, I've been directing for a long time, but it's still quite intimidating to walk onto a set with some of those big hitter names. And, um, and again, just not wanting to you know, make the day all about, you know, some new person coming in. You just want to, to you know, blend in with everyone and not ruffle too many feathers. But um, yeah, of course, in, initially it's intimidating, but um, I was lucky enough I got to meet them at the table read for my episode when they were shooting another episode. And um, they were all incredibly friendly, gracious, and that really helped actually. And I... I know absolutely, hands down, that they uh, trusted me perhaps a little bit quicker than they would if I hadn't had the connection with Jesse. Um, honestly, I think the way he, he you, the way you introduced me on that day, Jesse, it was obviously like, oh, okay, they get each other. Therefore, I think I just did sort of fast track a tiny little bit of um, with their confidence in me, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it's, it's incredible, but, um, and also I must point out, must you, um, that it's my first, it was my first drama. So I'm a comedy director, uh, by trade. <laughs> and, um, so this is my first drama. And I remember when I was asked to do it, having a chat with Mark Mylod, who's, uh, the executive producer and sort of probably the main uh, director he directs most of the episodes per season and uh, funnily enough I'd worked with Mark years ago at the BBC so I did know him and um, I said well it's a bit different isn't it doing suddenly doing drama 
um, will I be able to do it? And he said, Becky, it's exactly the same. You're still, you know, you're still on set. You've still got all the same problems. You're still telling a story. And he's absolutely right. It was the same, apart from the fact that there were moments when I realized how lucky I was that I was watching a monitor and I was able to just enjoy performances, you know, that are off the scale without uh, looking for jokes and gags. And did that joke work? And do I need this shot to make that work better? Um, uh, obviously there are jokes and that was great when, when I had some, but I did have quite a, a doom laden episode, didn't I, Jesse? I'm like, I remember Mark telling me, he said, oh, your episode, he said, all I can tell you at the moment is that it's, um, it's uh, quite um, an emotive one because it's the first time Kendall goes back to visit the, the house of the boy he killed. Um, and so I didn't know anything beyond that, but of course that's sort of quite exciting that you get something you know so dramatic and um i'm but i but even that causes anxiety because you think well I, I have to get the tone of that right the ending of um season one you know when when all that kicks off and that amazing scene with brian and jeremy at the end you think well i can't stuff that up you know that dynamic um and i'm i mean that uh, that we were trapped in a very tiny house, <laughs> which is very unlike Succession. Um, and Jeremy, I must say, was, you know, he's, he's incredible. We, we decided that day to stay, I mean, not only practically because we were in a small space, but we kept the camera very much focused. We were either, we were either walked in right behind his head or we were right under his face in, that's when he sat at that kitchen table um, to sort of, try and get the idea of him, you know, sort of like in a suffocating space. And um, he's a method actor and he did it several times, but my God, some of the touches he put in, you know, the, the, the one I, I mentioned to people was like, I just think was a magic touch that he, he gave to it. There was no direction. You can't really give him any, he doesn't want information before a scene. He doesn't want to know where you want him to sit. You, you just, he follows his own spin with it. Um, uh, was the little wiping of the glass with the dirty dishcloth. He just did that on a take himself. And, but it's a magic, you know, it says so much. It says so much about the character, you know, trying to offer up. It's almost like that's his pathetic little apologies. Well, at least I can, I've killed your son, but at least I can wipe your glass. So... Incredible. Um, cause yeah, it's true, Jesse, isn't it? This is one of the most tonally, this goes very dark. Um, in that sequence where they visit the home of the family of this dead guy. And, um, and it was that very much something you wanted to explore in this episode that, and, and I feel like we get to see him more of a, a human being, you know, even though he's done this terrible thing and he, but there is a kind of, it does humanize um, the characters. It does humanize Kendall particularly, which I guess is why the, the camera focused so much on him in that episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have a ton to say about that. I think it it, it it broke so that Becky had yeah an episode that was pretty one of the more one of the more somber ones. Um, I mean, I think I've got a bit of a prejudice in favour of comedy people. I always feel like if you if you're working with somebody out of the comedy world, they're going to be able to do the comedy, and usually if they're sensitive, smart person as Becky is. They, they know the drama, they can feel where the drama is going to be, but somebody who doesn't have a comic sensibility, you can never explain how to cut and get comedy. Um, it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's too ephemeral. So, um, so I'd much rather be shooting a serious scene with a comic director than a, than a comic scene with a director who doesn't have a facility for, for comedy. <laughs> that's, yeah, I'm sure. I was going to ask about a couple of moments in, in the episode, actually, which which which, which struck me. One was um, a Roman. There's a scene where Roman's in the car um, with Logan, and it's quite tense. There's a lot of tense encounters with um, the kids and Logan in this episode. 
And after this incredibly tense sequence in the car where they're driving along and Logan's being pretty horrible and saying horrible things, um, Roman just looks out the window and, go, and says, fucking cars, buildings everywhere. And I thought that's such a brilliant moment where he just doesn't, doesn't know what to say. Was that always in the script, Jesse? And, um, you know, was that kind of just, again, a moment where you kind of see what it's like to deal with this dad, this father figure? Yeah, it's in the script. That was something very similar, sort of not a non sequitur ending. Uh, uh, Kieran's a terrific improviser, but that was that was in that was in the script, as I as I recall. Um, and uh, there's there's some great moments um, with uh, Tom and Greg. That this is the this is the episode where they burn they burn some of the um, key documents that they're covering up. And, he, and um, Tom just leaves the investigators and we, we never see again. And I was again going to say, like, I would imagine most kind of people might set, give you a note saying, surely we need to go back and see what happened to the investigators. But you just leave them, which I thought was a brilliant thing. Um, was that something you were ever tempted to go back and catch up with them and see them almost for comedy purposes or just leaving them was funnier and better? Becky, we didn't do, we, something changed in the cut for that. Can you, but I don't, we never, we never had a second hit of it, did we? I think I think it was something to do with the fact that we. I think it was some when when Tom catches up with Shiv, and says, "I'm not going to get you know f screwed, am I?" Um, I think the intention was that that was in a slightly different order, so that you you we never we it was never scripted or never shot that he went back and and followed that up but i think you always assumed that that he was going to and that he just saw her on his way out but on that on the day i think i said to you i'm going to do some alternative takes where he says that was terrible this is terrible you know it's just like we we kept uh, doing a few different and i think we ended up going with the the past tense that was terrible just because it's sort of you know otherwise they're left hanging there's nothing else you can yeah you so we don't know whether maybe he has just gone back in and you know it's quite nice not to know some of these things so uh, essentially becky saved us she saw what was going to come in the cut and <laughs> uh, did a little and got got us a little get out of jail but yeah i think that i, I remember there was something about that and that was that was a, a smarter way to to um, affect that kind of that movement out of the investigation. Um, I'm going to come to um, some of the questions. We've got loads of questions from the people watching, but before I do, let me, I want to ask a couple of things. One is the music, Nicholas Patel's music is phenomenal. Surely one of the best theme tunes in history. Um, ha, what, can you, can you p describe why it works so beautifully, that theme tune, why it fits <laughs> the show so well and the title sequence, I guess, together? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, no, I can talk a little, I, Nick is lovely, he's super smart, he's sort of polymath um, and could probably write the show as well as score it if he needed to and um, it, it, uh, it's the first experience I've had with uh, doing music with somebody, I'm not very articulate about music, I'm an unmusical person but he manages to intuit sort of mumbled half sentences into a vibe N not that I describe what I thought the theme tune should be but he I, met, I went to his apartment and he played me some stuff including a version of something like the theme tune and um it, it was like this is I remember I, I remember sitting there and the hairs on the back of my neck standing up because it felt like this is it has something I think courtly some some grandeur it has something wonky it has some of a hip-hop antecedents and, and, and he says i wouldn't have known this he he says it's in waltz time it's in uh, three three beat time which is inherently unsteady and there's something always kind of falling over and catching itself about the piece which is yeah, I still like listening to it in the in the edit. It's one of the most most shows you're doing. You you you, you skip past that, but every time I watch a cut, I like to watch it because it, it does what a, a, a good theme does. Right, it puts you in the in the space of the show. Yeah, Becky, in, in your in this episode, there are some lovely moments where that theme comes in, kind of variations of that theme coming at key moments. I guess was that was that a, a great thing to be able to work with for you as well? 
Yeah, although I, I have to say, because it is such a collaborative process, um, a lot of the, the music used through the episode was actually chosen by the editor as he was putting it together, Bill Henry. So, I mean, obviously he'll have stuff to work with. He puts something on as a guide, maybe when he's just cutting it in the assembly. But sometimes if it works so well, you know, you can't even imagine ever taking that piece off. You know, that uh, mm. particularly the sort of low level tense stuff that was um, with following Kendall in that, you know, in that uh, house uh, when he revisits. I mean, you know, Bill decided to put that on. Why would you change that? It's, it's genius. So, you know, that I, I can have an input in that, but quite often, you know, it's a huge collaboration and the editors know exactly what they're doing and they know what sort of tone and if something that they put on works, perfect, then you, you wouldn't want to change it. Great. Right. I'm going to go to um, some of the many questions we've had in. Uh, first of all, Cara Noble asks, Jesse, you mentioned the original idea for Succession and about your Murdoch um, script, um, which was unable to be made. Was that because the Murdoch stepped in? Yes. <laughs> Uh, that would be a good succession plot. Not, 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 the, not that I'm aware. Great. Um, Tommy asks, Tommy Jessup asks, do you often laugh out loud while you're writing the show? Uh, not, 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 not normally when I'm typing, uh, <laughs> like write, writing, writing, but the, the writer's room, it, it, we do laugh a lot. Yeah, it's, 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 it's probably, you know, hour by hour, the best part for me of making the show is the writer's room. It, it's a very talented and funny group. So it's pretty good on good days. Can I ask one additional question to that? Is it must cool. change it slightly like from season one when you didn't, when perhaps you're writing scripts and you don't know the cast so well. And when you know what the cast can do with stuff. Yeah, we had the pilot. But... Of how, how well it's working. Cause you sort of imagine them saying it then. Yeah, it definitely, you definitely, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a benefit and a danger. The benefit is you, you get them in your head and you can feel the rhythms and you know maybe what people are good and, you know, to, to, to write towards. The, the danger is that you do that too much and you sort of, you know, end up writing parody of yourself or, or you know, just um, get... I, I, yeah you get you get high on on your own stuff in a way which is not good for the for the show well on the casting actually nadine nor asks about the casting um can you talk a bit about the casting how it came about i guess my question for that did you start with um brian and then fill in the rest of the, how, how, did you have certain people in place first uh we, we didn't have anyone in sort of in place like uh, approached or offered um, we had a brilliant casting director, Francine Maisler, who cast the pilot, um, and she knew McKay. McKay had a few people he suggested. He, he'd worked with Jeremy Strong on on The Big Shore. I think originally the idea was that he might play um, Roman, and but then we saw Kieran early on and felt like, well, no one is going to be able to do this better than this, are they? And then, so Jeremy, almost by default but the role anyway it felt good for him to be um to be Kendall we uh, Brian was the first person who we wanted to approach for for Logan and he he's he was he said yes um Sarah Snook was um uh, an idea of Francine's I think she knew him I, I guess she'd had, had I had actually seen her in a black mirror but I didn't know her and she was Francine's idea and, and was brilliant and Nick was Nick Braun was also someone she brought in um, I knew, well, I didn't know Matthew actually at all, McFadden, but I, I, I had admired his work for a long time and um, encouraged Francine to get to get him on tape for the group. And, um, and uh, well, I don't, I don't know if we actually did get him on tape or whether it was an offer, but anyway, he was, he was, he was quickly brought in. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think of the many, you know, fortunate um, collisions of collaboration on the show the casting it, the cast is just they are they're a nice group of people and uh brian's good humor you know emanates through throughout the group and 
that they're a real dream to write for and that they they all have a facility for even when they're not doing comedy they know when comedy is happening around them and and uh, and, and they're, they're they're a dream to work for i bet yeah g joby asks um who wrote tom's spinach line in that awful dinner they deserve a knighthood that's will tracy's episode and will tracy wrote it great um Zara Mears asks, the show has a unique tone for an American show with that very British sense of humour. Did you have to fight to keep the tone whilst working with American development executives? I think I'm afraid to say, I think this is a bit of an English-British vanity that we have a different tone. I think, if anything, I, I, I feel like British dramas and don't straddle that line as well as American dramas do. And, you know... Uh, some shows which I admire enormously, Six Feet Under, Sopranos, that's the, the, the two that spring to mind. I think uh, that they do comedy and drama all the way through. In fact, sometimes I feel like both those shows sort of are twisted comedies really. Um, so, so, our, so we didn't have to fight at all with the, with the execs in terms of the tone. They, they liked the pilot and that's, that was, that's always been the tone of the show. Leslie Ann McFarlane asks, how much of the blocking was written into the scripts and how much was it a process between the director and the cast and crew? Um, well, some of it is written in when it, where, where, where it's really necessary. But, um, but there's, I would say that's probably where I would have quite a bit of input. Um, particularly, I mean, in my episode... The scene when um, the kids go back and visit their mum, when Shiv and Roman go back and visit and Harriet Walter, who suggested what a dream uh, to work with her. But there's that, it's quite a long scene of her getting a terrible dinner together. And um, that was actually the first scene I shot. And poor Harriet had come in and sort of worked out exactly where she was going to sip a, 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 a drink of wine and you know what she was going to do when and I said to her sort of frightened her a little bit because I said I need you to be on the move a lot of the time uh, because what that does is you know sort of accentuates the fact that she can't really kind of bear to be with her kids gives their gives them moments to look at each other without her seeing them just gave us a bit more to play with I think so, I mean, in terms of that blocking, we sort of, I sort of fried her brain a little bit because we had to try a lot of stuff and there was an extra thing I think I put in Jessie where I sort of needed her to go out. So I suggested she just said potatoes quite <laughs> randomly, which luckily Jessie agreed to. Just something to keep her on the move, to keep it on edge. So, you know, so that you sort of doubly got that she really wasn't that invested in, in having them there. Um, so yes, I mean, in terms of blocking, that absolutely was sort of down to down to my suggestion, and it worked really well in terms of the location because the kitchen was just off that big dining room. Um, but you know, other times you get people and they're literally just sat in a car. Well, there's nothing you can do; they have to sit next to each other. And one thing I um, I admire you for, Jesse, is you uh, will always go for, like, shooting in cars is a pain. It's, it's very time consuming. But, and quite more often than not, uh, productions cheat and they will set up a, a car in the back of a studio and have green screen and they, they'll rock it a little bit and put the lights on. They'll say, oh, if it's a night scene, it's fine. No one will know. Well, they sort of do know. And, um, a couple of times I know just because of the, the the production having a few busy days I think you were asked if we could do something like that for one of those scenes I think it was a scene that didn't make it in the end it was a scene with um, Greg Nick Braun uh, after he's got the papers from Tom as like he's he's rescued some of those papers from the burning fire I think there was originally a little scene written where he either got an Uber or a taxi and we were talking about, oh, how can we fit that into our shoot day? And I think the 
the, it was raised because it was like, oh, well, the only way we're going to do it is if we stick it around the back of the studio and do it. And you absolutely said, no, no, if you, you know, we didn't do it in the end just because I think we didn't need it for the story. But that is so. So all those um, scenes in cars, you know, they're bumpy. Occasionally the camera will bump. You don't we don't get like a smooth run at it sometimes. But I think it's definitely worth keeping it for real with that. Thank you. That's so interesting. That that dinner scene was incredible with the the pigeon with the shot and feathers in it. Just to, yeah. add to it. um, Sylvia Parker asked a question. I think this is a, this is a good question because a lot of people have mentioned this kind of thing with 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 Succession. Is were you ever worried about having so many unlikable characters in one show? Yeah, I think um, foolishly not. I think probably in retrospect we we should, we should have been. I've always felt. Um, the shows I like are about interesting people, not necessarily likable people. I, I, maybe it does limit your audience to some extent. Luckily, we're on HBO, which is a subscription service, and it's not as cutthroat for numbers as, as you could be elsewhere. Um, so, no, I, I never gave it a thought, really. And and I, 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 I wouldn't know how to write those people in this world so um comedy it, helps with that though doesn't it jesse what the comedy helps with that because it sort of gives us an a, a little key into them is. isn't it it's like you know if they were just horrible people who said horrible things all the time i don't think you would invest in them but the, when they sort of undercut each other occasionally with humor it's something that we can hook onto somehow it makes them yeah, and I mean uh, that uh, maybe that's what makes it bear a bearable watch in the in, because they are um, not traditionally likable. I guess uh, I mean there's a there's a it's um, there's a, a level I guess somewhere ingrained in the show of a point of view about this world and these people. Um, but I would also say that um, when you get to know someone, whether it's in life or a show, and you get to see where they come from and the, the psychological and material forces that have made them, you feel differently about them eventually. And, um, you know, it's not an apologia for the characters you see in the show or how they behave, but I think it's true people are not, in my opinion, born evil, Machiavellian, avaricious. They end up that way because of the of, of what happens to them. And, and maybe if you stick with the show, you get some of those feelings of, you know, sadness, pity, melancholy about the about the, about where, where these people come from. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Kate Cheeseman asks, how many cameras do you use? And with it and with extra improvisation, etc., how much extra do you shoot? Uh, we two cameras, um, and I would say improvisation wise mm, doesn't add that much, really. It's not like they, you know, completely rework the whole scene. We write like long, though, right, Becky? We shoot, we shoot. How much was the, how long was the first cut? Probably long. Mm -hmm. Uh, my episode was um, an hour and 20, something like that. So there's 20 minutes to come out, which is sort of, you no know, pain, painful and, and good. It's a necessary process, I think, that you end up with too much. It makes you really, you know, then you really fine tune and hone what needs to be in the show. I mean, we had some nice scenes that... You know, there was a scene where Kendall does go to the pub and gets a bit drunk and walks across the road. And, and it's just as he gets money uh, that he, he, we then reveal that he's going to post through the letterbox of uh, the parents of the dead kid. Um, so we shot that whole scene, but ultimately it didn't really get us, you know, much further in the story. It didn't need it everything you know worked without it so I think it's good to shoot 
way more gives you a problem in the edit because ultimately you you have editorial say about what goes in and what what comes out but but i, I love it we i i, I we, we i there's a you know certain pressure always from production and all, and the people who are paying for this you know very expensive process of shooting maybe 10 percent of stuff we know isn't going to fit in but I, I think it does add a lot to the quality of the show you you can make because if something just you don't like it or you, it doesn't work uh it just you it can go and 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 you know it's kind of becomes quite darwinian and, and the the scenes which survive um are strong and you can come out as early as you want and come go in as late as you want so i i think it's well worth it um yeah. but it's sometimes a fight there, there was that, another yeah. little tiny scene which was more of a comedy scene, really playing on that double act between um, uh, Matthew and um, Nick. Uh, There's a when, couple of them there. Yeah, when, when we're at um, Greg's apartment and Tom goes to visit and he says, you know, I don't, how can I trust you that you'll give me the papers? I'm going to stay overnight and I'm going to come in with you in the morning. And so we, we shot the scene with um, Tom sleeping in Greg's bed and Greg sleeping on a duvet on the floor. Um, and that was, it was hilarious on the day, but maybe that was probably what went against it in the edit, because it's like you were saying, it then, it then felt like it was too uh, comedically charged or placed or just didn't. So that went out, didn't it? But it's fun yeah. to shoot. <laughs> I really want to see that scene. <laughs> Dennis Mabry asks, could you talk about the process of rehearsals? How much rehearsing do you do? Not much at all. Not really. We um, get the read through, right? And that's quite useful. It's very useful from a writing point of view. Definitely, and yeah, definitely. And even just, even for me, just seeing how, how the episode flows. But in terms of rehearsal, not really not that much. They're all so good that they they don't really need it and apart from just we have a blocking rehearsal so uh, so we have to have some limitations and I'll say what I'm thinking and sometimes that shifts if they have a different idea of what they think they'd like to be doing some actors you give complete you know kind of free reign I'm thinking of Kieran being one of them to like in that um scene when they're in the UK and they're having the conference call I mean, I said where he needed to start, but I kind of let him just do whatever he wanted. So then he'll, he'll, you know, there's that lovely moment where it's all very dramatic going back between London and New York. And then you, we just cut to him playing with his hair in the mirror. You know, that's just something he did on the day and we, we capture it. So it's nice not to absolutely pin them down. There's just occasionally when, when, if it serves the story better, like the dinner party, where I felt that it needed the tension of her moving backwards and forwards. But other scenes, I mean, they, they, all, they all know their characters so well. And we'll have a blocking rehearsal and a technical, you know, a technical rehearsal after that so that crew can see, you know, any potential problems. But that's as far as it goes, really. I think, I mean, especially for... Jeremy, because he's method, he doesn't really like any rehearsal or prep, and you know he was fine with some scenes. I could say roughly what, what I well where I needed him to start and finish, and it was kind of leave him up to it, leave it up to him as to what he did in between. Um, but right. in a way, I think it probably helps that we don't rehearse too much because it adds a kind of you know energy and attention to some scenes if you if they knew it inside and out then it wouldn't have that edge to it sometimes yeah um and zoe lubeck asks how did you go about staffing the writer's room were you looking for any unusual traits or experience in your writers or was it based on your own network uh, a little bit uh, it was a, a sort of mixture a bit of my own network there was some several people who i've worked with um before john brown tony roach and uh, Georgia, who I hadn't worked with directly, but is in the British comedy world sort of thing. And then reading some script, 
lists of people who I admired from uh, the world of theatre, where we've drawn a lot of our writers from, uh, Lucy Preble and Susan Stanton, who's American. And yeah, well, I wanted a mixture of American writers. I wanted it to be roughly half and half men and women. Um, so we, 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 it was, it was a mixture. It was a mixture. And some people who um, HBO suggested, some people who had been around shows um, of this sort of scale before, like Jonathan Glatzer. Um, uh, yeah, so a, a mixture, not a completely closed shop of just folks who I knew by any means. Um, and, and yeah, and, uh, and those, the, a variety of voices, ideally, and ages. Thank you. And I think this will have to probably have to be the last question because sadly we've run out of time. But Peter Bowles asks, the last episode of season two on the yacht reminded me of the pacing of an episode of The Apprentice, but with more helicopters. There's a real, there's a real life feel to your style. Was this episode at all inspired by reality TV? No, although um, McKay was a big fan of, do you, do you know the reality show Below Deck? Yes. Uh, so he introduced me to that and uh, maybe Below Deck had been knocking around my mind. And also once when I was in, in um, uh, on holiday somewhere, there's a scene where Shiv and um, Tom are looking for somewhere to have a, to go and they kind of dismiss a little cove and I, that, because it has some sea urchins or something and that I was on a little cove and some people from a very big yacht came around the corner on one of those big boats uh, small boats from the big boat still quite a big boat with about eight of them in it and they looked just looked at one look at the at this essentially paradise this little greek you know bay and we're like no don't fancy it let's go and then and just tore off around in their in their um little speedboat and I thought that looks that looks ba you know here you are in heaven and you're living in hell uh, on that boat but you know going around and dismissing places because you uh, don't like the look of them so um there was a bit of reality but not a reality tv show fair enough uh, actually I'm going to give you one more question which is Sophie Flanagan because I really like this question all the show's characters lie more often than tell the truth does this have an impact on how essential story plot points are communicated in the script it sounds like it's a question that's so clever I don't really understand it. <laughs> but um, but it, I do feel when I'm writing uh, uh, for, for writers who are on this, you know, watching this, I feel like it's the simplest and one of the most frequent things that human beings do is just say the opposite. You know, how are you? I'm great. And, you know, how's the company? It's going great. It's, it, normally people are lying. I, I would say. So that's my normal approach to writing a scene is that everyone's lying the whole time and it's fun for the audience because we all, we see it and we know it. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, um, that, that, that maybe is the answer to that question. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jesse and Becky for um, so many insights into the, into the creation of the show. Um, can't wait for season three, obviously. I'm sure you'll sort out how that's going to happen in the, when the virus ends or we get rid of the virus. And thank you to everyone who sent in questions. I'm so sorry I couldn't um, ask enough of them. We have so many, like dozens of them, but um, maybe we'll do another one eventually uh, when season three arrives. And thank you to BAFTA and everyone for organizing this whole event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Boyd, and thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us and remember you can listen to previous BAFTA sessions and podcasts at guru.bafta.org.